We do thank you, Father, for the sustained opportunity to study this book and to learn about two men, Father, who each in their own way represent the, the ways men can come to know you and follow you or not follow you, as it turns out. And, Lord, we thank you for their examples. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for the chance to concern ourselves with which of the two is a better representation of us. And perhaps, Father, we find ourselves on one day like one and on another day perhaps like the other. And, Lord, that's just a reminder that we live in a body that is never going to serve you by its own might, by its own will. But instead, Father, must be disciplined. And we ask, Lord, that you would let us learn even more tonight about what is, what is required if we're to follow you and to uh, hear from your spirit and to seek for your will above our own. And, uh, Father, also I thank you just for the consistency of our time together over the last few months and the chance to study and, and to do this in an uninterrupted way and, and to have been in this room doing it for so many years. Father, what a testimony of your faithfulness just in that. Speak through me, Father. I ask that every week because I don't want to be up here, Father, speaking what I know and what I think. For what good is that? What does a man know in, in relationship to what you can offer? But we ask, Lord, that your spirit would be the one who speaks. And, and perhaps even as I look at my notes, Father, you would give me the, the right words to speak, regardless of what I wrote down. And in the hearts of those who hear, Father, you'd explain it better than I ever could. And you pray, I pray, Father, you do this tonight in, in, uh, in mindfulness of your son's glory among us, that he would be at the center of all that we think and, and say. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So in chapter 28, we drop back into the moment when Saul's paranoia and his pride and his arrogance has driven him to seek the counsel of that medium, the woman that Saul met with after having told all his servants to kill all such women in the kingdom. This person, this medium, as they're called, was a woman who practiced bringing people an opportunity to speak with dead spirits, the departed spirits of people they once knew. But in reality, as we studied last week, these practitioners never actually make contact with dead people. Instead, they're simply encountering evil spirits who impersonate dead people. And they do this as a charade to control those who would come to them seeking such counsel, which is why the Lord has said to his people they should never seek such counsel. Men like Saul, in fact. And it was Saul's desire to seek the counsel of God through the dead prophet Samuel that motivated him to come to this moment. And what God did in response to his seeking was to give him the very thing he sought. God, in his power, raised up a vision of Samuel's spirit so that Samuel could speak to Saul. And his response to Saul was appropriately harsh. Samuel told Saul he was sinning because of his desire to seek the counsel of the Lord in this way. And in fact, the Lord had no interest in speaking to him, so he should stop trying to hear from him. And then at the very end of what we saw last week, Samuel declares to Saul that he is destined for the grave by the next day and that the kingdom had been ripped out of his hands. It was now to be David's. And therefore, not only would Saul die tomorrow, but so would his son Jonathan, so that his dynasty would come to an end, that his house, that is, would not inherit the throne. Samuel's words to Saul had to have been stunning and devastating for Saul to concern himself with such matters, to have heard such things from the Lord. And the next section reveals just how concerned he has become. Let's go to verse 20 of chapter 28. Then Saul immediately fell full length upon the ground and was very afraid because of the words of Samuel. Also, there was no strength in him, for he had eaten no food all day and all night. The woman came to Saul and saw that he was terrified and said to him, Behold, your maidservant has obeyed you, and I have taken my life in my hand and have listened to your words which you spoke to me. So now also, please, listen to the voice of your maidservant and let me set a piece of bread before you that you may eat and have strength when you go on your way. But he refused and said, I will not eat. However, his servants, together with the woman, urged him, and he listened to them. So he arose from the ground and sat on the bed. The woman had a fattened calf in the house, and she quickly slaughtered it, and she took flour and kneaded it and baked unleavened bread from it. She brought it before Saul and his servants, and they ate. Then they arose and went away that night. So we remember the scene, right? He's been in her home. He came there at the night, remember? And at the hearing of this judgment from Samuel, Saul, it says, falls essentially stiff to the ground. You can imagine him almost like a corpse laying on the ground in fear and in distress. Now, whatever you may view of this man, of, of what he's done, of all that he said in the past, of what he may have done to deserve this outcome, nonetheless, it's still hard not to feel at least some pity for him here. He has heard that he 
is going to die tomorrow. And more than that, he's heard his own son is going to die with him. And he's been given the reason for that. His reason, the reason for that outcome is his own sin. Now, we remember that by faith, Saul is saved from the judgment in eternity that sin requires. But sometimes the Lord permits the consequences of a person's sin to rest upon them to a degree, even while they're still alive. And he does this to chasten them, to correct them, in the hope that they'll seek for better things from him. But in the worst of cases, which is the one we're looking at here with Saul, the Lord may bring a person to the end of their earthly life as a consequence for extreme sin. That's the situation Saul's in at this point. And it must be a hard thing to know that the Lord is determined to bring that kind of a judgment upon you, to know the very day, in fact, to know it's coming the next day, that you're going to die. And then even worse, of course, to know that your son gets to die with you on that same day. That had to have been devastating news. And the worst part of it, ironically, was knowing it in advance. And, of course, he brought that upon himself because he sought it. He sought this news. He went after it in an inappropriate way through demons. In in other words, it would have been through demons had God not intervened. But the point is he sought it in the wrong way. Had he not gone against the commandments of the Lord in the seeking of advice from this medium, he never would have known. I'm not proposing the outcome would have been any different. I'm simply saying he wouldn't have had to suffer the knowledge of it in advance, which only added insult to the injury, really. In fact, his suffering is so acute, it leaves him on the floor, it says here, for some time, or so it would seem, because it says he ate no food that day or all that night. And so what it seems is going on here is the night is coming to an end. He's been there most of the night with this woman. And this woman wants him to leave her home. And he won't get up. He won't go. And in another of these role reversals that I mentioned, they're so common in this book. Now the medium is a source of comfort for Saul. And the, so you have the king of Israel who should have had this woman executed for doing what she did. Instead, she's now ministering to him, indicating how far God or how far Saul has fallen from God at this point. I mean, he's he can be refreshed by a woman more familiar with demons than with God. It's a sign of where he's fallen. And now the woman speaks to him and the words that she says are very similar to the ones that Samuel used just a moment earlier in the vision. But they're reversed again. Samuel had just said that because Saul didn't obey the Lord, the Lord would do something to Saul, that is, take his life. Now this woman says, because I have obeyed you in performing the service that she said she did, I want you to do something for me. And the language in the Hebrew is almost identical. And it's intentionally so, so that as the reader in Hebrew saw it, they, they pick up on the contrast. And you see this throughout the book. We haven't taken a lot of time along the way to observe these, only in a couple of cases. But that's one of Samuel, the writer, Samuel's traits, is these role reversals in which he takes um, the lives of Saul, David, and others in the story and illustrates how they're moving in opposite directions by creating these role reversals. Now, I say create, not in the sense that he created the the circumstances, but in the way he chose to, to record it. The narrative reflects that. The meaning of that pattern, the reason you have role reversals, especially in Saul's case, is to remind us that he's operating 180 degrees away from the commandments of God. He's living in what I would call opposite world. That's a phrase that you may have heard others use as well that describes the fallen world perfectly. The fallen world celebrates everything that is the opposite of what God declares to be godly. And one of my favorite examples is the world says that you are temporary and the whole world is permanent. You know, things are made of billions of years and will last for billions of years and you're here just for a second. And so we care more about the world than we care about you. We, you know, we save whales, not babies. The Bible says the opposite. The Bible says you're eternal The world is temporary. It had a beginning, it has an end, and you go on forever after it. It's an indication of how the enemy, the father of lies, takes what is godly, twists it to 180 degrees, and trots it out as an alternate truth. And Saul and David, their lives have been moving in that opposite direction. Whatever is true from what God sees, Saul does the opposite. And then in verse 22, the woman reminds Saul of his obligation in keeping with the covenant that he made with her earlier that evening. Remember earlier, she put him into a covenant by asking him to protect her, that he wouldn't allow her to come to any harm for what she was about to do. They went into a covenant. And covenants, remember, are not specific in the same sense that a contract is. Covenants are more general. To enter into a covenant means to enter into a relationship with someone in which you pick up their interests and they pick up yours. You defend their honor, they defend yours. You protect their life, they protect yours. And it's not just in respect to some certain thing of life. 
It's a covenant for life in all areas of life. That's what covenants achieved, generally. So they've entered into a covenant, and so she appeals to him on this basis, insisting that he eat, that he do what she wants him to do for his own sake and for her sake, probably to facilitate his departure from her home. But in a great moment of irony in Saul's life, he refuses the woman's request. And why is that such an ironic moment? Because what he just did is violate his covenant with her, just as he's violated the one he had with the Lord. In other words, this is a reflection of his heart. He makes promises that he never intends to keep. Covenants mean nothing to this man, even to this woman. How many times have we seen him make promises, for example, to David, that he would never harm David and he would forever be grateful to David and he would certainly be king one day. Then he would turn around the next page we're reading and try to kill David again. This is his pattern over and over. Now he's doing it even to this woman who's just trying to help him get food and get out of the house. Ultimately, the woman with the help of his servants convinced him, and that's another pattern in Saul's life. Where does Saul finally get his advice and how does it finally result in his action? Only when a servant of his gives him advice does he finally act on it. Again, in contrast to the Lord. In fact, she's so determined to get him out of the house, she's willing to kill a fatted calf and feed Saul and his servants what will be ultimately his last meal. I think she goes to this much trouble in part to ensure that the covenant is official because in most cases a covenant would include a normal meal of this type, fatted calf, unleavened bread, and so on, which became a kind of seal to the agreement. In any event, with that, he leaves the woman, he goes out, and he's going to prepare for the coming day's battle. Now we switch scenes. We leave Saul, and we go back to David. Last time we saw David, remember, David was getting ready to enter into battle with the Philistine king of Kish and do so on his behalf, remember, pretending to be a friend of the Philistines. Before he can enact his plan, whatever plan he had, the commanders of the Philistines around him object to his presence on the battlefield. Verse 1 of chapter 29. Now the Philistines gathered together all their armies to Aphek while the Israelites were camped by the spring, which is in Jezreel. And the lords of the Philistines were proceeding on by hundreds and by thousands. And David and his men were proceeding on in the rear with Achish. Then the commanders of the Philistines said, What are these Hebrews doing here? And Achish said to the commanders of the Philistines, Is this not David, the servant of Saul, the king of Israel, who has been with me these days, or rather these years? And I have found no fault in him from the day he deserted to me to this day. But the commanders of the Philistines were angry with him. And the commanders of the Philistines said to him, Make this man go back, that he may return to the place where you have assigned him. And do not let him go to the battle with us, or in the battle he may become an adversary to us. For with what could this man make himself acceptable to his Lord? Would it not be with the heads of these men? Is this not David, of whom they sing in the dances, saying, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands? So the Philistines are massing in Aphek. That's a town in the north of Philistine territory near the Jezreel Valley, sort of on the western border of that valley. The mention of Aphek actually brings us back full circle to the beginning of this story because it was back in chapter 4 where we first saw the Israelites going to battle against Philistines in this story, then under the command of Samuel, who was directing Israel at the time as judge, and they were against the Philistines in the same place, in Aphek. Why is it so important that we see this full circle? Well, it seems to emphasize for us that the 40 years of Saul's rule in Israel has done nothing to advance the security of Israel in relationship to the Philistines. Here we are again, same place, same army, different day, and Saul's had 40 years to solve this problem and has done nothing. As we heard a couple of chapters ago, David and his men are marching into the battle with the Philistines back in the rear of Achish's ranks, And we don't know exactly what he was planning. Obviously, that hasn't been disclosed in the text. But we can fairly assume David was going to turn on Achish in the midst of the battle at some point. We we can see, I think we'd be fairly certain he had no literal intent to fight Israelites in the course of the battle. This is all a ruse. He's hoping to get into the battle. And then while he's there, he's going to do something to undermine the Philistine victory. Well, that's what the, the fellow commanders of Achish also assumed. And therefore, they object to David's presence, asking, why are there Hebrews here? I mean, that's a very comical moment to me. I think these men are preparing to kill as many Hebrews as they possibly can. And they look up, all of a sudden, there's a whole bunch of Hebrews standing right around them. It's like a football team discovering a player from the other team in the huddle. How did you get here? What are you doing here? So naturally, they object. It only makes sense. And they make the very sensible argument, which is, 
when he gets into battle, what's the best way he could prove himself to Saul? Wouldn't it be to kill a bunch of us? Isn't this the perfect place for him to be if that's his goal? And Achish starts the defense by saying, is this not David? And of course, he means that in the sense of, isn't this the same David who's been serving me so faithfully for 16 months, right? But the commanders use Achish's words against him. If you notice there at the end, they say, is this not David again? They're mocking him. They repeat that well-known song. Apparently, it was so well-known, it made its way across even into the Philistines, that David was so famous for having killed so many Philistines. And it also highlights how Saul and David are united both in their purpose and in their goals. They both were off killing Philistines together. They're kind of united in that. And so they ask Achish, now exactly what could someone like David have done to ever make him acceptable to you? They're asking him, what is it that's caused you to trust this guy? What could he have ever do to make you trust him this much? And so they mock his naivete. Basically, they see through what David's doing and they know how dangerous he can be. So they tell Achish, get him out of here. And then Achish has to deliver the bad news to David. Verse 6, Then Achish called David and said to him, As the Lord lives, you have been upright, and you're going out and you're coming in with me and the army are pleasing in my sight. For I have not found evil in you from the day of your coming to me to this day. Nevertheless, you're not pleasing in the sight of the Lord's. Now, therefore, return and go in peace, that you may not displease the lords of the Philistines. David said to Achish, But what have I done? And what have you found in your servant from the day when I came before you to this day, that I may not go and fight against the enemies of my lord the king? But Achish replied to David, I know that you are pleasing in my sight, like an angel of God. Nevertheless, the commanders of the Philistines have said, He must not go up with us to the battle. Now then, arise early in the morning with the servants of your lord who have come with you, and as soon as you have arisen early in the morning and have light, depart. So David arose early, he and his men, to depart in the morning to return to the land of the Philistines, And the Philistines went up to Jezreel. It's sort of an interesting moment here, isn't it? There's a lot of text devoted to the exchange of what is really nothing more than, you got to go. Do I have to go? Yeah, you got to go. Okay, I'll go. Which would tell us there's something else that we need to get out of it, right? More than just the facts of what's on the page. It begins with Achish acknowledging David's done nothing wrong, as far as he can tell, in the 16 months that he has served the king. Furthermore, he says, I'm pleased with what you've done. And he probably was pleased for, among other reasons, the fact that David was bringing booty to him from down in the south. Nevertheless, he says, my fellow lords here, they're not happy with you. Sorry, you've got to go home. And then David, it's interesting that he's trying so hard to stay in this place, to be in a battle that, from our point of view, seems odd, right? Why would he want to go fight his own people? He says he only wants to fight against, quote, the enemies of my lord. Now, we can only assume that what David is doing here is deceiving Achish. Because when he says, my lord, the king, he could have been referring to Achish, but more likely he's referring to Saul. Yet he knows that Achish thinks he's referring to him, which is part of his deception. Then in verse 9, as this thing ended, Achish vindicates David. Now for the third time, and if you were keeping count, he's already vindicated David to the Lord's once in verse 3. Then he vindicates him to David himself in verse 6. Now he vindicates David again in verse 9. Nevertheless, David has to go back. If you notice what he's doing, Achish is treating David unfairly in terms of the facts, despite testifying three times that David has done nothing to deserve this treatment. And in that one small detail, you find this picture of Christ in the fact that Pilate denied finding fault with Christ three times and yet still condemned him. So you see Achish, in a sense, acting that same way, David playing the part of Christ once again, Now, that's putting aside the whole fact that there's a subterfuge going on, but just in terms of the facts, it, it produces that picture. And the whole scene is a bit odd in that David would seem to be working so very hard to become part of something that he likely could not have controlled very well had it come to pass. I mean, think about it. I mean, he may have had some plan. We still don't know what it was, but... You know, he probably had some idea, some thought, you know, when we get to this point in the battle, that's when I'll do what I want to do and I'll turn on Achish or something, right? I don't know what he was thinking. But what if that plan hadn't worked out? What if things didn't go the way he expected? I mean, in the fog of war, there are an infinite number of ways things don't go as planned, always. And in fact, it's probably more likely that David would have found himself in some dangerous, uncontrollable set of circumstances than it was that something would work out exactly as he planned, if it's all on him, in other words, if it's just his planning. What David's forgetting in his scheming is that he's working without the counsel of the Lord. 
in what he's planning to go do. If the Lord had orchestrated all this, if the Lord had told David, hey, this is the plan, go do this, well, then David could have moved forward in confidence that the Lord already had all those details worked out. He wouldn't have had to be so concerned. He could have just walked into the battle, and it would have come to pass. And that's what he's seen in the past. All the battles he's won before, that's what he's seen. But the difference this time is that David has not sought the Lord. Nothing he's doing right now is from the counsel of the Lord. As we observed last time, David's not praying to the Lord as we have seen him do in the past. He's not seeking his counsel from the high priest or in any other way. In fact, as I said, God's name does not appear in chapter 27, nor in this chapter, apart from the brief moment when Achish mentions the Lord's name to David just to mollify him and not really to appeal to him. So in other words, David's on his own here. He's dangerously close to making what I suspect would have been a very serious mistake. One that might have got himself killed or his men killed. He might have been put in some kind of situation in which it was either follow through on his threat to kill Jews or be killed himself. I mean, there's any number of circumstances that could have taken place. Which is why I think you see the Lord's invisible hand here stepping in to protect David from himself. David's being prevented from going into this battle. And he's being prevented against his best efforts to get his own way. And as we're going to see later in the rest of this chapter and into chapter 30, it becomes evident that he's being sent home by God. Because even as David is resisting the Lord's will, nevertheless, the Lord is still at work protecting David and helping David get to the right place. I love seeing the Lord working this way with David because it gives all of us, I think, some hope that even in our worst moments, the Lord does not stop blessing us We aren't in a relationship with God that's a quid pro quo relationship. He's nice to us and he blesses us only so long as we're nice to him and do what he tells us. That's not grace. That's the definition of not grace. (laughs) Gracelessness. Right? So what we know in scripture is the Lord acts like a good and perfect father that he is. Which is to say he steps in to rescue us when necessary so that we don't run with scissors or play in the street. You know, spiritually speaking, the Lord knows David is trying to use his situation to Saul's benefit. I mean, if you want to put it in simple terms, his motives are pure. The problem is he's going about it all the wrong way. The Lord not only wants us to serve his purposes or his goals, he also wants us to do it according to his plan, according to his methods. There may be a lot of different ways to achieve something that is in keeping with God's purposes, but that doesn't mean all of them are equally valid or godly, right? To say it another way, the end does not justify the means in serving God. You can't say because I wanted to do the right thing, the way I chose just happened to be my own, it's still valid. That doesn't work. The Lord wants us to seek his goals by following his plans. And you can know his goals or his purposes just by reading scripture. You know, in other words, you can understand what righteousness requires just by reading what the Bible has to say. But you can only know the specific plan that he has for you in reaching those goals through prayer and through taking note of the responses you see in the circumstances God puts you in in life. As we like to say, he closes some doors while he's opening others. Those kinds of personal, individual responses of God in our life are ways in which he directs our plan, but they don't take the place of Scripture. Scripture gives us the goals and the higher purposes of serving God, which do not vary from individual to individual. But how I achieve them will certainly differ, depending on what God's plan is for my life. I need to see that plan and live within it if I'm to achieve both his purpose and do so in the will he has for me. And he'll convict you and I from time to time when we get off track, or he'll encourage us when we're getting on track. We've probably all seen both sides of that at times. David, as our example for the night, is being pushed, or as we would say, a door is being closed for him in one side, And another is going to be opened on the other side. And it's being done because he's got the wrong plan, even though he might have the right goal, which is to undermine the Philistines and to honor Saul. Next, you're going to discover why the Lord wanted David to return to Ziklag rather than to enter into the battle. That's chapter 30 now, verse 1. Then it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had made a raid on the Negev and on Ziklag and had overthrown Ziklag and burned it with fire. And they took captive the women and all who were within it, both small and great, without killing anyone, and carried them off and went their way. When David and his men came to the city, behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted their voices and wept until there was no strength in them to weep. Now David's two wives had been taken captive, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite. Moreover, David was greatly distressed because the people spoke of stoning him 
For all the people were embittered, each one because of his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. The circumstances of chapter 30 serve a couple of purposes in the larger story of David's ascent and Saul's fall. First, in this chapter you're going to see the consequences of what David's sin brought upon himself when he entered into the Philistine territory 16 months ago. This whole episode of him wandering in and serving Achish and all the rest. Again, right goal maybe, proper motive somewhere in the heart of David, but wrong plan. And there are consequences for mistakes sometimes. Here you'll start to see some of them. Um, And so David's moving to Ziklag without the Lord's approval. He's avoiding the fight with Saul. He was supposed to stay and contend with Saul. That was part of his spiritual development. He's resorting to deception at various points along the way. All of this stuff now demands a reckoning, and God is bringing that to him. But the Lord is good to those who love him, and so the Lord will ultimately turn these circumstances to good for David and for Israel. So this is not merely about punishment. This is about another lesson. And this is probably the most important comparison between David and Christ that you'll find throughout the books of First and Second Samuel. It's one that comes up repeatedly. You'll see it here today, clearly. And that is the comparison of how tragedy turns to victory. For David and, of course, ultimately for Christ, sorrow leads to joy. In other words, Christ's death leads to our salvation. Here you see David's missteps, his sin, in other words, his deception, and then now this, ter- this terrible thing that's happened to him and his men will ultimately be a means of salvation and victory for David. So as the circumstances unfold, we'll start at the top. David's absence with the Philistines has given the opportunity for the Amalekites, who David was you know, killing not too long ago, to come back in and avenge David's attacks by attacking Ziklag. They come to the city, they burn it, but they don't kill anyone. They just take everyone with them. Obviously, David and his men are greatly distressed by this. They they weep until they're exhausted. I think any of us who could imagine our families in this situation would completely understand the feeling. More striking still is the prospect that David's men are considering stoning him for his poor leadership. Obviously, if he hadn't made the decision to enter the Philistine territory, or attack the Amalekites for that matter, none of this would have happened, and that's what must be on the minds of his men. You brought this on us and on our families. Ironically, David made the move into the Philistine territories. Why? For safety. Yeah, seeking safety for these same people, right? In the process, he put his men at greater risk. Friends, the safest place any of us can be is in the will of God. And when he left the will of God to go into this territory, he took on greater risk, though from a fleshly point of view, a worldly point of view, it looks safer. That may not be the place that's most peaceful, necessarily, in being in God's will won't always be the most peaceful place, but it assures you the greatest protection, and David's learning that lesson now. And then at the end of verse 6, we find a phrase that we have been waiting to see for three chapters now. David strengthened himself in the Lord. Now, this doesn't just mean that David is finding physical revival or even spiritual resolve. It's actually a very subtle statement, but it has a very specific meaning. It indicates the moment that David returns to a practice of seeking the Lord's will rather than following his own footsteps. This, you might say, is the repentance moment for David. It's the mention of God that, that's been missing now for so long in these chapters. At this moment, you have the clearest distinction between David and Saul, the clearest contrast in the entire book. When Saul was faced with great distress and at the end of his life contemplating a defeat in the face of the Philistines, he sought demonic counsel because he had a silent God. David enters the same kind of crisis, different facts, but a similar kind of moment. He responds by seeking the Lord. So if there was a single lesson of 1 Samuel, that is it. Seek the Lord. And David knew that. Saul didn't do that. That's also a powerful illustration of how every child of God experiences their walk with the Lord. And by that I mean there are times we're moving into his will and there are times we are moving out of his will. And it's typical for all Christians that I know anyway to walk closely with him for a time. You find strength, you find joy in that, and you find some measure of spiritual fruit. We all have probably seen that from at least some point in our life, if not right now. But for whatever reason... We may begin to feel either confidence in ourselves or something else takes us off track. We begin thinking maybe we know what we're doing. And then we step outside his will in some area of our life. We start living the plan of our own life. Just as David has experienced in his life, he went victory after victory over Saul as he walked in the wilderness with the Lord. But then at some moment, for reasons of his own, he ran to the Philistines for personal protection. That's when he went off the Lord's will. So when you step outside the Lord's will... Remember, he doesn't forget you and he doesn't leave you, according to Scripture. What he does instead is he works patiently in the background. 
First, he may give you a little time to experience the foolishness of your decision. He may let the situation play out for a little while, letting you collect a few scars along the way as you experience what you're doing. But even after all of that, even after your rebellion, the Lord is still there. He's still watching over his children. He's still protecting them from the worst of their mistakes. He's still turning those mistakes to good in some ultimate sense. And just as he stopped David from going into battle here, a battle he had no business getting into and couldn't have controlled, God saw that coming and he pushes David away from it. Likewise, he's helping us avoid destruction. And he'll do that through methods we all know real well. Counselors, friends, family, other means of correction. Things that will prompt repentance. Because his goal is to get us to see it for ourselves. So that we act as a volitional thing. We move in our own will to come back to him where we need to be. As we do that, as we repent, he delights to pick us up and just move us forward from that point. And that's what you're going to see the Lord doing now with David. David's turned back. It had to be one of the lowest moments of his life. After all the years of running, seeking aid among his enemies... Even now his enemies won't let him do what he wants. He comes back, his family's gone, and now the very men, the only ones he has left, want to kill him. He seeks the Lord. Verse 7. Then David said to Abiathar, the priest, the son of Ahimelech, Please bring me the ephod. So Abiathar brought the ephod to David. David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this band? Shall I overtake them? And he said to them, Pursue, for you will surely overtake them, and you will surely rescue all. David returns to consulting the Lord here for guidance. What's so interesting about this is he's always had Abiathar with him. He's always had the ephod. God didn't stop talking. David stopped asking. David always had the opportunity to find out things like this. Why didn't he ask back in the day, should I go into the Philistine territory? Is that the only way I'll be saved? Or would you save my life if I stay here instead? I mean, whatever question you might ask. He never did any of that. At the point that he returns to the priest and asks these questions, you can almost hear the Hollywood soundtrack beginning to play this soaring, victorious music right at that point. This is the crescendo moment at the end of the movie where we finally see our hero going back to the way he should have been working all along. He's passed the final test, at least in terms of what God has planned for him before he becomes king. This crisis will cement David's trust in the Lord and it sets in motion the events that lead him to becoming king. He says, now look at the question here. He says, should I overtake them? Now that's no small thing, friends, when you consider what's at stake here. The question, in other words, is no small thing. Obviously, every member of this community is determined to go retrieve their family members. Wouldn't you agree? They're so angry about the loss of these folks, they're ready to kill David over it. And yet, can you imagine what would have happened if David had told them, I asked the Lord and he says, we can't pursue what would have happened to David from that, at that moment? I mean, he's taken this huge risk. David asks the Lord, can I go do the very thing we're all ready to go do and would have done otherwise? It's a striking moment. This is a dramatic example of submission to the Lord's will. This is dramatic as much so in its direction as David's departure was in previous moments. Because there's those moments where you ask the Lord, should I quit my job? I'm not sure what I should do here. You know, or should I move? Things that are really hard decisions that aren't clear one way or the other. There's pros and cons. You want the Lord to push you over the line one way or the other. And then there are those decisions that you're 110% convinced you are going to go do. And you kind of ask God on the way. Would you bless this thing I'm about to go do? You know the kind I'm talking about? Because you're so set on the need to do it, you're not even interested on what God's opinion is. You just want him to bless it along the way. And even if he doesn't bless it, you'll work it out somehow. And this is that kind of a moment, I would argue. This is the kind of moment where it's hard to imagine what he would do if the answer was no. And yet I believe the fact that he asked is an indication that he was willing to go whichever way God pushed him. And that's one of the high points of all Scripture. I think this is one of the highest points in all the Old Testament of a man submitting to the will of the Lord. It doesn't come off the page in a dramatic way like Abraham and and Isaac in the same sense, perhaps. But when you look at what was at stake and you consider the nature of the question, I think it illustrates this extreme submission and willingness to let God decide the outcome. And, of course, the Lord does grant the permission he sought. And that would give David ultimate confidence to go pursue the victory. Now, think about this. While Saul was desperately desiring to hear the Lord's counsel but couldn't, David receives an easy answer to the question as soon as he asks, right? What's the difference between David and Saul? That's an important question because both these men know the Lord. Both these men have the Lord's anointing. Both men sin at times. Neither of them is perfect. But when Saul sinned, the Lord brought correction and wouldn't give him any answer. With David, he does. 
The answer is that Saul's heart was hardened to correction and fought back against the Lord's discipline. And as that process took hold, Saul moved further and further away from the Lord. And at a point, the Lord confirmed Saul's place outside his counsel. That's the pattern of Scripture. That's a devastating place for any believer to find themselves in. The writer of Hebrews warns us to stay away from such a place in our relationship with the Lord. Hebrews 3, 7 and onward says, Just as the Holy Spirit says, Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as when they provoked me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore I was angry with this generation and said, They always go astray in their hearts, and they do not know my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And then the writer says, Take care, brethren, that there not be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And in that passage, the writer draws a comparison between believers who act in unbelieving ways and compares that to those in Israel who were in the desert during the Exodus. Those Israelites in the Exodus, they saw and heard from the Lord in dramatic ways, and yet despite that, they just continued to go astray. Their error illustrates the danger of taking for granted God's activity and His revelation in our life. The Israelites were granted all those unique and powerful revelations of God, but it was for nothing in the end because they made no good use of it. Instead, they just squandered the grace that God offered. They turned against the Lord time and time again, and... As a result, they reached the point where they were not impressionable by God anymore. Similarly, the believer can find himself or herself becoming hardened by repeatedly turning away from the Lord because, as the writer says, sin is deceitful in that it lies to us. And what he means by that is sin lies by convincing us that if we obey our own desires, that is a better course than obeying God's desires. And it also lies by convincing us that you can live in open rebellion to the Lord and do so with impunity. That there's never a consequence for it. That since consequences haven't come so far, well, maybe they'll never come. That's the problem with what Saul's doing. His heart has been hardened by the deceitfulness of his own sin. He sinned long enough that he came to believe there's no other way he can be. And as he went, his heart lost its capacity to receive God's rebuke or to be sensitive to the consequences of his errors. And his heart, therefore, becomes hardened. And what it means is that the tools God would use in our lives to bring repentance are no longer effective on that heart. They just bounce off. And once Saul reached that place, there's no coming back. The tools that would bring him back are ineffective. Meanwhile, look at David, on the other hand. David has done some similar things and seen some similar consequences, I mean, in one fashion or another. But when he experienced the negative impacts of his decisions, we've seen this in several places now, he chooses to change his path. He responds to the correction. His heart remains sensitive to the rebuke. So he returned, in each case, to seeking what the Lord wanted for him. And when he did that, the Lord was there waiting for him and moved him on. That's the difference of the story between Saul and David. This is not a story about a sinful king and a righteous king. It's a story of a hardened heart and a faithful heart. It's a story of one man deceived by his sin and another man corrected by his sin. And after the Lord gives permission here, David takes his 600 men and begins his pursuit. Though, you know, at the beginning of this, he doesn't know where he's going. He just runs out because God tells him to. But because he's following the Lord's counsel, he has the confidence that the Lord's going to take care of the details and point him in the right way. And so he does. Verse 9, so David went, he and his 600 men who were with him, and came to the brook Besor, where those left behind remained. But David pursued, he and 400 men, for 200 were too exhausted to cross the brook Besor, remained behind. Now they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David and gave him bread, and he ate, and they provided him water to drink, and they gave him a piece of fig cake and two clusters of raisins, and he ate. Then his spirit revived, for he had not eaten bread or drunk water for three days and three nights. David said to him, To whom do you belong? And where are you from? And he said, I'm a young man of Egypt, a servant of an Amalekite, and my master left me behind when I fell sick three days ago. We made a raid on the Negev of the Cherethites and on that which belongs to Judah and on the Negev of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag with fire. Then David said to him, Will you bring me down to this band? And he said, Swear to me by God that you will not kill me or deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will bring you down to this band. 
David and his men go south. There's a brook called Besor. It's probably the same brook that is defined in the book of Numbers as the border between Israel's property and what would then be Egypt. Uh, so it's, uh, it runs just south of Ziklag. And uh, it's interesting that David's men fall in line with him when he leaves. I mean, we didn't give that any thought in the text, but if you think about it for a minute, they're ready to stone him. And then he says, okay, guys, let's go. And they all go. One minute they're ready to kill him, next minute they're ready to follow him again. The only thing that would explain that change of heart is that they saw David consulting the Lord. In other words, godly leadership inspired them to follow after him again, where before it may have been that they were finally tired of him because they realized he hasn't been consulting the Lord in all that he's been doing, perhaps. Anyway, the Amalekite raiders, they've moved from where they were in Ziklag back south. They've been apparently roaming in this whole territory freely between the territory of Egypt and the Hebrews and the Philistines, etc., and they start heading down this way. And as they make that move down there, some of the men get very exhausted. I mean, they've already walked all the way down from the Jezreel Valley, and they've been exhausted from their, from their distress. And now they just don't have the energy to go any further. So David leaves 200 of the men that he has with all his camp equipment. It says baggage later, but basically all the baggage. And takes only 400 men now to go fight. Now, you might think that would discourage someone under his circumstances. You lose a third of your already really small force to go against whatever you're facing. But now because he's following the Lord and he's not doing this in his own power, he doesn't show any doubt, he doesn't show any fear. Uh, Spurgeon, when Spurgeon looked at this moment in the text, he had this remark. He said, when God means to bless us, he often takes away a part of the little strength we thought we had. We did not think our strength equal to the task, and the Lord then takes away a portion even of the little power we had. Our God does not fill till he is emptied. 200 men must be rent away from David's side before God could give him victory. Expect then, O troubled one, that you may be delivered, but know that your sorrow may yet deepen, that you may have all the greater joy by and by. An interesting idea, isn't it? So in kindness, David allows 200 men to rest. And that's one of the details to pick up on here. It comes up later as we get into chapter 31. David's a kind man. He's not a tyrant. And then there's also an advantage because by leaving these guys with the baggage, the rest of the guys are lighter and more capable of moving quickly, and so it's an advantage for them as well. That's reminiscent of his battle plan against Nabal, remember? He did the same thing with Nabal, left some of his men with the baggage and took the rest into battle. Anyway, as they move out, David and his men finally come upon an Egyptian. That's kind of an odd thing, foreigner out here by himself in a field long way from Egypt. What are you doing here? That leaves them to think he might have some connection to this. Let's take him. They make him captive thinking he might know something, or maybe he's just seen the band pass by and he knows where they go. But it turns out the guy's so weak, so famished, he's no use to them, at least till they give him some time to have strength. Remember, they left all their baggage. So they're not carrying a lot of provisions here. Anything they give this guy is coming out of somebody else's mouth, pretty much. And yet, they go ahead and they take care of him. And not just with the basics, the minimums. I mean, he's getting fig cakes and stuff. He's getting some good food, nice stuff. And... He has the strength, it says, to be interrogated. He confesses, yeah, I was part of the raid, burned the city. Uh, As an Egyptian, he's probably a slave of one of the Amalekites, maybe captured in a previous battle with the Egyptians, who knows. And therefore, he's not speaking as one who had a personal grudge against David or against Ziklag. He was just a hired hand, just doing his job. So he's not really a target. And he gives David the whole story, really. And then at that point, David realizes this man could lead him to the camp. And so he says, take me there. And of course, the Egyptians worried because... He'll make an enemy of his master if he does that. He's already an enemy of David, by definition. So he needs someone to protect him, so he's got to win over one side or the other. So if he's going to go irritate his master, he better have David on his side first. And so he says, I'll go, but you've got to promise to protect me, and David agrees. The entire scene is recorded for us so that we can see the heart of David in the midst of battle. He regards even the lowest men amongst him, even his enemy, with respect with kindness. That's a trait that will follow David all the years of his life. There's a man named Shimiel who spits on David as he's leaving the city at one point in his, in his reign. And David doesn't let his man hurt the man, even though he could have been killed for that. This is a mark of a man after God's own heart. Just as Christ said in Luke 6:35, love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great. You will be sons of the most high for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. And David's exa- showing us an example of that. Then, lastly, David goes into the camp. I just thought we'd like to finish with seeing the battle here. So, verse 16, 
When he brought him down, behold, they were spread over all the land, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil that they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. David slaughtered them from the twilight until the evening of the next day. And not a man of them escaped, except 400 young men who rode on camels and fled. So David recovered all that the Amalekites had taken and rescued his two wives, but nothing of theirs was missing, whether small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything that had been taken for themselves. David brought it all back. So David had captured all the sheep and the cattle, which the people drove ahead of other livestock, and they said, this is David's spoil. So just as the Lord promised, right, he says, you will capture them, you will get it all. And sure enough, they do. They fight all night long into the next day, destroy the enemy, freeing all the captives. And then you hear this little interesting detail. 400 of the Amalekites escape on what was the sports car of the day, camels. You have got on a camel, you weren't going to get caught. But the significance of that number is that it's telling us that David's force was so vastly outnumbered such that just the ones who escaped were equal to what he brought into the battle to begin with. And so the point, of course, is that the Lord delivered a victory to David on that day. It wasn't because of David's military might. His victory is so complete, we're told, nothing's missing, not even his possessions. And in fact, the Amalekites had possessions taken from other peoples besides what they took from Ziklag. And those are the possessions David now takes as spoil for himself and brings that back. And it says here, it's called David's spoil. That becomes an issue here at the end of the chapter, which we will not do today. What we'll see next time is the distribution of this spoil takes up the next five verses and all the way through the rest of the chapter, which you would think is sort of an overstatement of that. We're going to study it next week. What it does is illustrate David's fairness and his concern for the welfare of everyone. And because of that fairness, it becomes the means that God uses to turn the hearts of Israel to David as their new king, even as Saul loses his life on the battlefield that day. Because when you have the king and the prince die at the same time, you leave a power vacuum in a nation. And David is God's choice to fill that vacuum, but we need the people to see the same thing. And so David's wisdom and how he distributes the spoil becomes the basis by which he wins over the population of Israel to then welcome him in as their new king in chapter 31. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, once again, thank you always for the example of David and Saul. And in our lives, Father, we ask that uh, the lessons we've learned would make their application in our hearts. Father, you'd show us uh, as we walk with you when we... When we turn astray, let our hearts stay sensitive to your counsel, Father. Let us see when we are not acting in your will so that we feel a kindness uh, that leads us to repentance. Don't let our hearts get so far from you we don't know our way back. For, Father, we know our eternity is safe in the grace that you offer through Christ, but we want so much more than that, Father. We want to please you. And, Lord, let that be uh, something you, you enable in us by, by how you guide and, and correct us as needed and how you encourage us and pull us forward correcting and protecting us from our worst. And Lord, help us to be that counselor for, for someone else, perhaps. That sound, that sounding board, that, that voice of reason, the one who might bring that one word of encouragement that helps someone else turn back. Let us all be useful to one another in that way, Father, for we have the joy of serving you and we also want to see your pleasure in the day we meet you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.